Hello and welcome to Darmascope. Today we're going over the basics of epithelium, what it is, how to find it and what types there are. First off, what is epithelium? Well, it's a barrier. One of the main things about being a living organism is the ability to control what comes in and what goes out of your body. Without a barrier, your insidey bits end up on the outside and everything's a disaster. So if you see a line of cells next to clear space, delimiting the lumen of an organ from the parenchyma, for example, that's epithelium. Sometimes you want the barrier to be as thin as possible so you can exchange molecules with the environment. And sometimes you want it to be thick so nothing can get in or out. Sometimes you'll want to move as many molecules across the epithelium as possible, secrete and move mucus or other really specialised activities. To do this, you'll need different cell morphologies and types, and that's where all the different kinds of epithelium that you'll need to learn about come in. So how do you find epithelium? My first tip is to look for the white space. White space means that there's a lumen or some other passage to the exterior world. The exception to this is blood and lymphatic vessels, but they tend to be easy to spot because blood vessels have red blood cells in them. Take a look at this section of large intestine. There's a huge white space in the middle, which is the lumen. That's lined by epithelium. Move a little bit into the mucosa, the lining of the intestine, and you'll start to see more clear spaces. These are the lumen of the colonic glands. They too are lined by epithelium and are continuous with the lumen. Let's have a look at a section of liver. Even here we can find some clear spaces in the portal tracts. Some of them are filled with blood and are blood vessels. Others are lined by different cells. These are the bile ducts, which are lined by epithelium. So what are the different types of epithelium? Well, whenever you find some epithelium, I want you to ask yourself three questions. How many layers of cells are there? What shape are the epithelial cells? And do the cells have any special anatomic or functional features? Let's begin our journey in the lungs. There's lots of white space here that must be lined by epithelium. Looking at the alveoli, you can sometimes see a little flat nucleus sticking out into the alveolar airspace. This is the epithelium. There's a single layer. They're flat and they have no special features. Epithelium with these characteristics is called simple squamous epithelium. You'll often find this type in areas where the body is trying to minimise the distance for diffusion, like the lung. These cells are so flat and thin they're impossible to see via light microscopy unless you slice through the nucleus. Want to see some better examples? Here's an image from a fish gill. You can see the lamellae of the fish gill are lined by a single flat layer of cells with no special features. One more example, a section of snail lung. You can see the lung lumen is clear space. Separating the lung tissue from this space, there is a single layer of flat epithelial cells, making this another example of simple squamous epithelium. Let's have a look at a section of skin. Among the hair follicles, which are lined by epithelium, but we'll come to that type later, there are clear spaces lined by a single layer of cells. The cells are shaped like little squares, with all four sides approximately the same length. Bearing in mind that these cells would be three-dimensional cubes, this type of epithelium is called simple cuboidal epithelium. It tends to be present in glands with the principal function being secretion of whatever the gland is producing. These simple cuboidal epithelial cells in the skin form the apocrine glands, also known as sweat glands. Another common place to find simple cuboidal epithelium is in the kidney. Most of the epithelial lining of the renal tubules is simple cuboidal. Some of these cells in the proximal tubules have microvilli lining the surface, which will facilitate reabsorption of important molecules. So on to the next type of epithelium, simple columnar epithelium. Once again, this is just a single layer of cells, hence the simple part. Columna refers to the shape of the cells. They're more rectangular and stretched out, with the short sides bordering the basement membrane and lumen, and the long sides against other cells. 
These cells are found predominantly in the lining of the gastrointestinal tract, where their main function is absorption and secretion, as well as forming a barrier against the microbes and unwanted substances in the gastrointestinal tract. Take a look at these huge columnar cells in the intestinal tract of a parasitic nematode. You'll notice that the apical surface, the surface facing into the lumen, is covered by tiny projections. These are microvilli, finger-like extensions of the cytoplasm that maximize the surface area for absorption. We can see similar structures on the intestinal epithelial cells in mammals. Columnar epithelial cells can also be described as pseudostratified. This type of epithelium is found in the trachea and bronchi of the lungs. If you look closely, all the nuclei appear at different levels, giving the impression that the epithelium is more than a single cell thick. But it's a trick. In reality, this is a single layer of cells, hence the name pseudostratified, because it gives the impression of being stratified. Here, the apical surface of the cells is adorned with another type of projection called cilia. Rather than being extensions of the cytoplasm, like microvilli, these are complex membrane proteins that project into the lumen. Their function is to move from side to side, often to shift whatever viscous material is on top of them, in this case, mucus. Unsurprisingly, snails, which are very mucousy, have great examples of ciliated epithelium in various different organs. Earthworms also have some pretty spectacular ciliated epithelium in the pharynx. Now that's all of the single-layered epithelial types out of the way. Basically, the type of epithelium is defined by the cell shape. Each of these cell shapes can pile on top of each other to form a new type of epithelia, the stratified epithelia. Let's start back at the beginning with squamous epithelium. When squamous cells pile on top of each other, they form stratified squamous epithelium. The skin is a classic example. The squamous nomenclature can feel a little bit misleading in the skin because the first layers of cells are definitely more cube-shaped, but as they mature, the cells flatten out. They also form keratin, a tough protein that helps protect underlying tissue against mechanical damage and forms an impermeable barrier. If you want to be more specific, this is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now in the skin or the epidermis, the epithelium can be divided into four different layers, but that feels like a topic for another video. Apart from the skin, you'll find keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in all kinds of places where mechanical damage is a possibility, including the oral mucosa, the esophagus, and even the four stomachs of ruminants. Next up is stratified cuboidal epithelium. This is quite rare, and you'll only find it in larger ducts in the skin glands. Compared to stratified squamous epithelium, it's kind of thin and usually only two cells thick, thereby barely classifying as stratified and not worthy of much further discussion. It exists, but it's rather uninteresting. It's also worth briefly mentioning stratified columnar epithelium, which is also very rare but does also exist. Mostly it's found in the conjunctiva, specifically the exposed sclera and inner surface of the eyelids. Moving swiftly on, we can reach our final epithelial type, transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium is found in the urinary tract, specifically from the renal pelvis to the urethra. Here's an example of transitional epithelium. You see that there is more than one layer of cells, so it can be described as stratified. The shape of the cells varies from cuboidal to flattened. The main property of transitional epithelium is to accommodate the wide variety of sizes that the bladder can be. It wouldn't be much good having a static skin-like epithelium. As soon as the bladder expanded to its full size, the epithelium would tear apart. Instead, transitional epithelial cells can adapt their shape depending on the bladder's size. When it's large and full of urine, they can flatten out to cover more area. And when the bladder suddenly and rapidly decreases in size, they can spring back to their original cuboidal shape. So those are all of the different types of epithelia. Remember, it's all about the shape of the cells and how many layers there are. Ultimately, the epithelia will function as the gatekeepers of the body. Some of them allow substances to pass straight through them, 
effect, while others will create an impermeable barrier to the outside world. Epithelial cells are everywhere throughout the animal kingdom, and when you start to move away from the histology of vertebrates, you can find some really weird and interesting cells. Big ones, little ones, odd-shaped ones, cells with frizzy bits on them, and cells with mucusy bits on them. That's all for now. If you have any questions or want to suggest a topic for a future video, then leave a comment below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.